And with your claps, Vitaly comes on stage. Oh, Shitty, what do you want? It's not what I want, sir. It's what you want. Ron, now we're talking. All right, what are you selling me? I'm offering you a subscription to the Daily News at a substantially reduced price. We're trying to reach out to people that have never had home delivery before. Right, so basically you're saying that everybody else who already has a subscription is getting fucked on this one? Yeah, I guess so. All right, well, I can handle that. So tell me, why should I buy your paper? I mean, you know, I, I mean, why shouldn't I get the Times or the Voice, you know? Well, the village voice is free, sir. So if you want it, you should certainly. Better than any other daily in New York, and we have the most reliable delivery in the city. Now, what do you think? You know what I think, Ron? I think that was a sales call. Good job, buddy. So you're going to buy a subscription? No, I already get the times. <laughs> All right, guys. Sorry for the technical problems. All right. So my name is Vitaly, I'm a designer by education, I'm an entrepreneur like you, uh, maybe you've been doing it a little longer than most of you. Um, I run a company called Keen, we have offices in Silicon Valley and in Ukraine. Uh, we're an e-commerce platform for the $640 billion print industry. And besides that, I spend a lot of time in Europe mostly, uh, working with different accelerators, helping startups get their shit together. Um, we put on a couple of big conferences in Keen. One in December, Startup Adventure, you might have heard of. Um, we'll be repeating that, and uh, you'll see more and more from, from my team in Ukraine. So let's talk about pitching. Pitching is one of the most important skills you will have as an entrepreneur. Uh, you're going to be pitching a lot more than uh, just your uh, investors. And we'll talk about that in a second. So what is pitching like a boss? It's an American expression. Like a boss is to own it, right? to have confidence. So this guy here, this cocky guy, is not a winner. This is a loser. But to be a boss, let's see if we get, there we go. That is confidence, right? So the one thing that you have to get, the most important thing to get confidence, is that you have to be the smartest person on your business in the room, first and foremost. So if you're familiar with, with grammar in English, there's a very important difference between these two statements. Um, so first and foremost, do your homework. I can't tell you how many times I've been pitched to where I know the industry better than the person that's pitching me their business. That's, that's the end. There's no beginning there, right? That ends before it starts. So do your homework before you ever start pitching. That's first. Question already? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. It's your job to give them the right information. Whoa. Uh, it's your job to give them the right information. So I'll tell you how to do that first. Before you get to the questions, and before the other person gets to the questions in your presentation, you, you have to deliver them the right information. All right? So let's talk about too many people in front of the clicker. First of all, who and why are you pitching? Like I said, you're not just pitching your investors. When you're starting your first startup especially, the first people you'll be pitching will be your family to let you do this crazy thing called a startup, right? The next people you'll be pitching will be your potential co-founders. You have to get them excited and passionate about this idea. Nothing exists there yet, it's just an idea. You'll be pitching your employees that have to take a pay cut or work for free and have to believe in what they're working on, right? And then finally, later, you'll be pitching investors. But you always have to kind of transfer your vision. If you can't convince somebody that you have a vision, that's just a hallucination. Okay? So think about why you're pitching and who you're pitching, first and foremost. And with every pitch, just like a sales pitch or a sales call, you have a call to action. You're not just pitching just to tell somebody 
about what you're doing, but you want them to do something, right? So let's talk about the three different types of pitches that you will all encounter very soon if you haven't already. Come on. Now we know the limit of this remote. I get to uh, do the, the debugging. Here we go. OK, so the very first pitch that you'll have is a 90-second elevator pitch. This is short enough for you to, to memorize in any language. You write it out. You have all the right content and all the right sequence. And we'll talk about that in a second, what that is. And you memorize it. Right? So this is your, your answer to the question of what if this is my second language. English is my second language. I just happened to learn it when I was nine years old. So your 90-second elevator pitch, you're not going to sell anybody there on anything besides getting a meeting. So all you're trying to do is give them enough information to get interested in giving you a meeting where you can talk about details. So don't pepper them with technical details and jargon about your industry. Just get them excited and interested to meet with you. Okay? Now, many of you will be pitching on stage at this conference, right? And any demo day, this is 500 startup demo day for example, uh, you'll be doing a three-minute pitch. And there you have two important things that you're trying to achieve. Okay? One is that you'll be in the middle, here you'll be in the middle of what, about 70, 75 companies? Right? And a typical demo day, it might be between 10 and 50. Right? So your job there is to stand out, because the investors in the audience are going to see all these pitches. You might be in the middle of the whole lot. And your job is to stand out and be one of the three, four that most investors or the right investors want to talk to after the event. Right? So you have to stand out and get the meeting. Right? Again, so do not put too much information, again, into this. Just put in the right things, the highlights, that will get people interested in your business overall to talk to you more. Now, if you've survived the first and or the second, and you kept somebody's attention, this is your opportunity to go deep. This is your 20 minute, 20, 30 slide presentation. It's 20 minutes that'll turn into an hour if the other side is interested because there'll be lots of questions. This is where you get your opportunity to go into detail. This is where it becomes a dialogue, not just a one-sided presentation, okay? So these are three completely different types of pitches. Click. No click. There we go. All right, so let's talk about content. First things first, very important thing. If you have an active business, and it's not just concept, if you have traction, that's what you start with. Right? So nothing matters more than traction. Nothing. You can have the biggest idea in the world, but if somebody comes and says, I have 10,000 customers and it's doubling every day, I'm interested. Right? Much more than your big idea, because it's proof. And if you already have that proof, and you start with that, that sends two very important signals to your investors. A, this is a real business, not just a concept, so it qualifies the right stage. Uh, if, if, you know, the investors will pick out if this is for them, if it's too early or too late or just right, right as far as business. And it will tell them if this thing is growing, and they should be, keep listening to your presentation. The numbers are good, they're going to be very interested. So if you have traction, lead with traction. Measure everything. That's the beauty of software businesses. Now, the next thing, or the first thing, if, it, if you don't have traction, is who is the customer? What is the problem? Pitch the problem. You cannot just jump into your technology if I don't understand what the problem you're trying to solve yet. Right? It's a very, very common problem. Right. Yeah, it's like 99% problem and then 1% interesting solution. So you always start with who's the customer, what's the problem? We are so and so, customers that have such and such problem, here's ne what's next, right? Now, when you give them who's the customer, what's the problem, the customer is me and the problem is the clicker, um, you have to have a it has to be a painkiller, not a vitamin. It can't be, it would be 5% better for them to do such and such. It's that they're in incredible pain and it's obvious that they want to solve this. They will pay money to solve this, right? 
And you have to make it obvious. It can't be inside baseball. That's another American term where you get into these details that only people that understand baseball understand it. You have to make it obvious to generally smart people, investors, especially if you're pitching them, that might not know your industry as well as you do. Right? It has to be obvious. How do you make it obvious? You give them lots of evidence. All right. No slides. Um, OK, so you give them lots of evidence. That means industry research, something that you can point to that's not just, I think it's a problem, but you have to kind of set up the market. And how is it currently being solved? Marvin brought that up, right? There is a way that it's currently being solved if it is a problem. It might not be in exactly the same way. So a common mistake is come out and say, we have no competition. Well, maybe you have a specific way of solving it. Maybe you're the first to do it mobile, but maybe somebody's doing it as a SaaS. Or the competition is that somebody's doing it on paper or manually, or they're not solving this problem at all. That's kind of a challenge. Right? So you have to talk about this. And this is when you talk about your competition. You don't need to get in depth on your competition, but you have to make everybody understand what kind of ways are there to solve this problem, just broad categories. Who falls where, and where are you in that area? Okay. So no competitors, no problem, no market, goodbye. And you have to, when you start kind of transitioning into talking about what you're selling, this is kind of a third of the way through your presentation, you have to make it clear. What is the problem? Well, the competition is not solving it because it sucks, it's too expensive, it's too painful. How are you going to be different and better? Not just different, but different and better. Right? So now, just now, when we know who's the customer, what's the problem, how is it currently being solved, why is that inadequate, now you can say what your solution is, right? So here's where you say, here's what we are, right? And then the next part is a little bit about how you improve, right? So th this is usually two sentences. We are so and so, and we do such and such better than X, right? Then what I recommend usually doing is doing a mini demo. Right, so you, you know the what, and now it's the how. One, two, three. One, two, three. Customers does such and such, they get, then they get this, and then they get that. So now we know who's the customer, what's the problem, how's it currently being solved, why does it suck, what are you guys doing, and how does it feel? Right, so now we're completely familiar with all these steps. And then we can dive into the market. Now that we know what it is that we're talking about, we can get into the market. And it has to be a big market, right? So for, for a lot of startups, they're trying to get to the US right away. I recommend not doing that, a lot of European startups. You want to use your country, if you're, if you're doing something for the global market, and Turkey is plenty big, but if you're outside of Turkey in smaller countries, if you want to do something eventually for the global market or Western Europe, UK, Germany, et cetera, use your country as a laboratory to prove your business, right? But then when you're talking about the market, it has to be a multi-billion dollar market, and it has to be growing quick. The reason for that is that if you can become a leader in a fast-growing market, you will grow with it very quickly. Right? You don't have to put in all the effort to eat an old industry. Okay? And then you can talk about the business model. How are you going to take this market? Business model is, you, know, you might not be doing revenue right now, or very soon, right? You might be optimizing for growth, but you have to have some kind of an idea how you can make money on this. And say, uh, here's this cool thing, we, we're gonna have a lot of users, they're gonna be free, and then we'll figure it out. Well, that kind of works for Twitter, maybe social networks, maybe in 2007, that's kind of the last time it worked. Today, you have to have a better idea of how this is going to turn in, into a business, and how is it gonna make money. So there's a couple of different types of revenue models. One is a symmetric one. Customer has a problem, you give them the solution, they pay for it, everybody's happy, right? This is your typical B2B SaaS, etc. Right? The asymmetric business model is, for example, advertising supported. This is a lot tougher. You have to be a lot bigger to make any kind of money on this, on this, uh, this type of business model, right? So like Marvin said, again, the 10 million is the new 1 million because with 10 million users, with average activity, that's not a very big business money-wise. Right? You have to get very, very big. So if you're pitching an asymmetric business model, you better know how to get those users. Right? 
And then ultimately, does it scale? That's a very important element that you have to pitch. And what do I mean by scale? Scale is the revenue per employee, right? So McDonald's has a couple of million employees and does $64,000 per employee. Good luck getting that funded these days. If you're going to say we're going to do a franchise, et cetera. It's very capital intensive. But if you look at companies like Craigslist, Craigslist is kind of a weird company to begin with. It's something like 25, 30 employees and do 100 something million revenue. But if you look at Apple, you look at Google, you look at Facebook, they're all in the million to two million or so per employee range. Those are great companies, right? So uh, another example too is when you start getting to financials in that long meeting and you're going to pitch somebody, uh, an experienced investor that you're going to get to a billion dollars of revenue in the second year with 100 people, then you're just going to get laughed out of the room, right? So you have to do your homework and you have to kind of fit into that model a little bit, right? So when you're doing your projections, about a million dollars per employee is where you should be, you know, when you're, when you're like year five. And that's also very hard to do. <laughs> yeah, it's incredibly hard to do. But that's what you gotta be shooting for. If you're gonna pitch that you're gonna do $100 million per, per employee, any experienced investor will use that to, to kind of see if you know what you're talking about or if you're a crazy person, right? So there's little things that are gonna, you're gonna stumble on. Now, to scale a business today is a lot easier than it used to be 10 years ago. You have a lot of internet-driven distribution models, right? a lot of different platforms. So you have to be aware of those, and you have to understand how you're going to use them, and you have to be able to talk about them intelligently. Right? So this is how you will scale to a million dollars per employee by using these different models. Right? And depending on what your business is, you have to do the research and, and utilize these things. Now, in an early stage pitch, the most important thing by far is the team, right? Unless you have crazy traction, that means the team is already proven, you're pitching the team, right? Everything else is, is a dream, is a projection, etc. But do I believe that this team can solve this problem? That's the big question, right? So maybe you stumbled onto an interesting business, maybe you got some interesting statistics, and maybe there is an opportunity there. But why are you and your team going to be the ones that solve it? Maybe it's going to be somebody else. All right, so this is a very important question. So what's a balanced startup team? What, what key elements do you have to check off on your list, and what do we look for when we look for good investments in early stage? First of all, you have to know your business. The business that you're going to be in, you have to have domain expertise in it. Some investors kind of, they're OK with some smart guy just graduating college and jumping into something. I tend to be very critical of this, especially if you're working in B2B. You have to know the business that you're in better than the average smart person. So you usually should have very hands-on experience in that business, right? Or at least one person on the team. Yeah. 10, 15 years in the industry, know the problem really in depth. Next is, if you're in the software business, you have to be able to make software. I cannot stress this enough, and I'll tell you why. Uh, if you're in the software business, software is your core competency. You cannot outsource your core competency, okay? That's a big negative. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if it's a couple of Stanford MBAs, Harvard MBAs, I don't care. If they have no way to make software, they do not have a software business. They have PowerPoint. And even if you outsource a prototype or early stage, you have to know that that's a very temporary solution. Right? I'll give you an example. If you go out and you get some team to build something even for equity for you, they'll build that first version. It'll take three times as long as you planned. It'll cost twice as much. Nobody will be happy. This is, this is normal. But the problem is that 99.9% .9 of the time, that first version is going to be bad and or wrong. So what happens when you need to improve on that? Next version. You have no team. You're going to give away more equity to do it all over again? So this is the problem. And this is a common trap. Companies get stuck. They might raise a little bit of dumb money from friends, family, rich friends that you know, are their investors. But then they get stuck and they can't produce a product. Right? The last piece is design. I'm totally biased because I have a design education. And I feel that design drives everything. But there's a reason for that. Especially when you're dealing with consumer products, now that's infecting B2B, the consumerization of enterprise and all of that. The people want a nice experience. Right? They will choose products based on the experience that they have. So um, 
the, in, the person that created the Apple Macintosh product, uh, his quote is that, as far as the customer is concerned, the, inter the uh, experience is the product, right? So what that means is that they don't care what kind of database you have, what you built it on Ruby on Rails, Java, Scala, doesn't matter. To them, what they see in front of them is a huge, huge important point. And in mobile, it's even more important. Because a good app gets opened for 10 seconds the first time, and 50% of the time gets opened the second time at all. And a bad app just gets opened, closed, and deleted. Right? That instantaneous first impression, new user experience, is crucial. So you have to pay attention to design and the customer experience. Now, what is your unfair advantage? Right? This goes back to the team, again. How are you a stronger team than, than a big competitor that has millions of dollars and hundreds of people? Yeah, because features, okay, so a big company with, with 200 engineers, how long is it going to take them to copy all your features? A weekend? So you have to have a com competitive advantage that's hard to replicate. And it's usually the experience in the industry, right? Or some kind of connections or some kind of partnership, something. All right? Accomplishments. This is when you need to brag, but you have to be good, good at it. <laughs> you have to brag and, and show that you've made progress, that your company is progressing, it's moving. There's momentum behind it, right? Very important, right? So have you raised money? Have you raised money from professional investors? Have you created some kind of partnerships that are important and key, right? Anything else? Growth, that's the big one, right? Growth kind of means that everything else is working. Now, when you close a deal, do not beg. <laughs> When you're dealing with investors, especially your first-time entrepreneur, you're going to be going pitching, you're going to be nervous. The people you'll be pitching have been doing this all day, every day, for a very long time. You're playing poker against the best. So get advice from mentors to help you navigate, and properly, don't, don't kind of give up half your company or half your valuation in that first ne negotiation. So you have to practice your closing skills and your negoti negotiation skills. Right? And there's a little... Um, there's a little uh, you know, common uh, knowledge here is that if you ask for money, you get advice. And if you ask for advice, you get money. Right? That's, when, that's when you're pitching, when you're doing kind of a casual pitch or when you're trying to get somebody. You met somebody at a conference and say, hey, I want to pitch you and get money, you're going to get advice. But if you say, hey, I want to show you something we're working on, right? and you show them this pitch, at the end they'll say, okay, so are you raising money? Can I, can I invest? Right, so it's, it's kind of funny in how it works, but after you do 10, 20 pitches, you'll see this happen. You'll start noticing this. Right. Now, in the venture capital industry, it's very much a relationship business. Right. So 99.9% .9 of the time, it happens through an introduction. It does not happen through cold emails. Do not be fooled by... Not through cold emails. Yeah. Don't be fooled by VC websites where they say, yeah, send us your business plan, your executive summary. Nobody reads that. That's how they punish their interns. <laughs> Nobody reads that. So don't get your hopes up. Only work through relationships, through connections. Yeah, the, one, the one point I'm going to make about this is that, that the reason that, that we have to count, count for the introduction is because if you can't get an introduction, considering with LinkedIn and all these other tools, it's like, how are you going to get in to talk to partners or also talk to customers, right? Like, that's a signal for us. Right. And a busy, well-known investor gets thousands of emails a day. Do you think they have any time to read any of them? No. So they'll use their network as a filter. Because if I introduce you to Marvin, or Marvin introduces you to me, they're acting as a filter, right? We're acting as a filter for each other. And we said, OK, he might, already be, he might be interested in this. So if, if somebody introduces you, that means that they are putting their, their word behind you. And also, don't make them look stupid if they do that, too. All right, you can only have a couple of bad introductions before I start ignoring. <laughs> Right. Okay, so uh, here's, here are, here's how introductions work. Right? Do not send a wall of email. Nobody will read it. It has to be very short and sweet. So here's a typical email introduction that I would do for somebody. Right? Dear so-and-so, I would like to introduce you to so-and-so, the CEO of blank. They solve the painful problem of blank for blank. They have blank users and are growing at blank percent monthly. They've done all of this on blank raise from friends and family and are now raising blank to achieve blank of which percent is already in. Don't miss this one. 
This gives all the information that this person needs to get to understand what, did, what does the company do in brief, where, what stage are they at in brief, if they have any kind of momentum, and should I do this now, or can I wait till I come back from vacation in six weeks? Right? This is the, the close, right? the, the uh, sense of urgency. And investors will not invest until they really have to. Investors are in the business of removing risk, and that means waiting for you to prove more. Why would I invest now if I can invest in six months at the same valuation, and you've already learned a bunch more things and spent somebody else's money and potentially failed or haven't, right? So you have to create some kind of momentum when you're trying to do a raise. This is beyond the scope of this talk, but there's a very specific way that you want to do kind of three stages of when you're doing your raise to actually do it in time and create that momentum. So when you are sending something, when somebody takes an introduction, you're going to send them your executive summary or a link to AngelList. The AngelList profile is basically an executive summary. You will not send them your deck. I repeat, do not send your deck. Right? People will tell you, send me your deck. Do not. Here's why. A deck is something that's designed to support you talking visually. If I gave you this deck before today, it would make very little sense. It's missing 98% of the information. Right? Your deck, the best presentations are on the news. Right? It's just over the shoulder. That's all that deck is. Right? So take a look at the news and see how they do their visuals. They're not putting paragraphs of text or even bullets or anything like that. Nobody's supposed to be reading the presentation because they're either going to look at you or they're going to read the screen. You want them to look at you. You want to be presenting. Right? You want to be in control of that conversation. And you don't want that deck to be sent out to all of their friends either. And when VCs say, oh yeah, we keep everything confidential, bullshit. I get several decks a week from my investors, from friends that say, oh, check this out. It's kind of related. You know, what do you think? It gets shared, so be very careful. Control your raise. Now, last and most important thing is your body language when you're presenting. This is very crucial. Right? And this is something that doesn't, doesn't come naturally. Right? There's nothing natural about standing in front of an audience and talking to people. It's learned, and it's practiced. And it's not something that people are born with, unless they're crazy. Right, so a few different things. First of all, confident stance. What is a confident stance? Like I've been standing, feet shoulder width apart. You're standing normal. You're not kind of leaning or trying to catch your balance. Right? One thing, too, is that when you get on stage, most people are nervous. And it's a normal parasymp parasympathetic response, the fight or flight response. Right, so you're either going to do two things. Either you're going to be nervously walking around stage. That means you're trying to run away. Right? A lot of people do that. They walk around for no reason. Or they're going to do a body wrap. They're going to do this. That means they're trying to protect themselves. Both of these things are kind of distracting, and they're, they're natural kind of body language communication tools. The um, person I learned from is Jerry Wiseman. He's kind of the, the, uh, the dawn of, of presenters and presentation training. And what he does is actually do American political debate analysis on mute. Right? So you can tell on mute who's winning just by how they're holding their body. Right? So open hand gestures is another thing, too. Right? You want to give people your hands, like shake their hands. You want to have a conversation. You don't want to point fingers. That's kind of accusatory. Right? That kind of makes you feel negative if I point at you. Right? But if I give my hand, completely different feel. So you want to do that. You want to move around. You can't just stand stiff like this and read in monotone. That's not interesting either. Speak loud and clear. Right? We've had a few little uh, hiccups with the microphone here. Right? And this is an example of exactly why you have to speak loud and clear. You have to be able to project so the person in the back of the room can hear you just fine. You have to be able to command the stage. Otherwise, you're going to see a bunch of people sitting there looking at their phones if you're whispering on stage. Right? You have to be the person that gathers all the attention on themselves in the room when you're on stage. Don't read your slides. Right? There's nothing worse than this, than showing your ass to the audience and reading the slides like you don't know your presentation. Right? And there shouldn't be anything on your slides to read. Again, everything on there is, think of it as a newspaper headline. Not complete sentences. Right? Not uh, paragraphs, for sure. It has to be like newspaper headlines. And it's just there to 
let the audience know what the topic is right now, right this second, and for you to kind of jog your memory. If you do it right and you have lots of different slides, instead of five slides with paragraphs on them, it actually helps you keep pace on your, on your presentation. Only talk to eyes. Remember this. This is a great way to, you know, it's very easy to remember, and what you want to do is you only talk to eyes. So what that means is you have a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations. Right? So you make eye contact and you deliver them a line. You make eye contact with another person and you deliver them a line. Right? When you're flipping your slides, you want to take a look for a second because the audience is seeing them for the first time. And you want to give them time to absorb what's on the screen and then take the attention back to yourself and talk about the particular topic. Series of one-on-one -on -one conversations. It's also a great way to pace yourself a lot of people will just get on stage, they get nervous, and they're going to start going really, really, really fast. Right? But whether the audience is this size of a room, or 20 people, or 20,000 people in the stadium, if you have a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations, you make eye contact with people, you're going to slow down and talk, have a normal dialogue pace, which is easy to understand for everybody. Right? And at the end, smile. Right? Because nobody wants to to have somebody aggressive on stage. They, they want to have a nice, pleasant conversation. Nothing, nothing better to do than smile and nod, and people will nod back at you, right? Most of the time. Most of the time. Um, so that's very important, is how you, how you conduct yourself on stage, right? So a couple minutes left. Let's see. Should, do, we have, do we have time for a quick, funny video? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah? OK. Guys, if you can get the microphone ready for the laptop. Put the mic up to, there we go. Put the mic on the, nope. Let's try this again. Some business idea that I just want to tell you about, and I'll be a fool if very quickly. What is the most popular thing in the world? Music. No. Tell me. Ice cream. Okay. Everyone has it. And what is the problem with ice cream? I have no idea. It drips. OK. So me idea is what? Yeah, to make a drip proof ice cream. No. Oh, that's a fucking brilliant idea, this. All right, whatever. You ain't going to come out with that, though. No, I, I promise you I won't. Well, me idea is to come out with just like these ice cream gloves that make the ice cream not go on your hands and make it all well sticky. And also keep your hands warm okay. when, when you is eating the ice cream. Okay. Is you in or is you in? Okay. Well, it sounds like a good idea, and I hope you make a lot of money. Good luck, folks. It's been nice seeing you. You take care of yourself, okay? Well, is you going to be in on that? Well, it sounds like an interesting We've got that like, P. Diddy is going to be in it. Good. <laughs>
how does we promote this company? We promote it with the strongest image. All right. All right, that's different. Naked woman <laughs> on a horse. Shaven or with like bush, whatever. You know, money talks, pubes walk. <laughs> All right. This may be, this may be the worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> I actually don't dislike the idea. Safe, respect. Yeah, but it's a, I don't dislike the idea. You could use it, you know, it's not, there's something to it. This is not going to happen. I just got another business idea. Um, okay, what is that? What's this? That is a skateboard. No, it is a toothbrush. No. <laughs> don't go. Okay, okay, what is it? Go on, Brian, what is it? We'll tell you what it is. Oh. It's a hoverboard. I don't understand what you mean. It's a hoverboard. As you seen Back to the Future, yeah. as you've seen the bit where, if, where they jump on the board, and it flies around. Yeah. It's in the future. Yeah. That film must have been about 10 years ago. No one has even thought about making that thing. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't do that. It doesn't do it yet. That's where you lot come in. You come up with the science. <laughs> we don't do that. This is nothing. It was, it's a film. It's well, a they story. must have used the board from somewhere. They made one of them that no. worked. No, no, no. So how did he jump on it and fly all around until all the chasers done? It's called special effects. How do they do anything in a movie? Good luck. You gonna put on the glove before you shake my hand? Okay, good luck, man. All right, so there you go. Don't be that guy. So that's it, that's all I got. Um, I'll be criticizing the shit out of your pitches, of course, for your benefit. Um, if you want the slides, follow me on Twitter. I'll tweet out a link later today. And um, if you have any questions, find me. Thanks. <laughs>